I killed Dietrichson. Me, Walter Neff, insurance agent, 35 years old, unmarried, no visible scars. Until a while ago, that is. Yeah, I killed him. I killed him for money and for a woman. It all began last May. I was thinking about that dame upstairs and the way she had looked at me. And I wanted to see her again, close, without that silly staircase between us. How could I have known that murder can sometimes smell like honeysuckle? I can't stand it anymore. What if they do hang me? They're not going to hang you, baby. It's better than going on this way. They're not going to hang you. Because you're going to do it and I'm going to help you. Yes, from the moment they met, it was murder. Always behind them with his devilish hunches and his brilliant brain was Keyes. The murder is never perfect. Always comes apart sooner or later. And where two people are concerned, it's usually sooner. Could they get away from him and his relentless pursuit? And could they get away with murder? You don't know Keyes. Once he gets his teeth into something, he never lets go. He'll investigate you. He'll have you shattered. He'll watch you every minute from now on. You afraid, baby? Yes, I'm afraid. But not of Keyes. I'm afraid of us. I'd like to move in on her right now, tonight. If it wasn't for Norton and his strike fans' ideas about company policy, I'd have the cops after her so quick it'd make a head spin. Now, we know the Dietrichson dame is in it, and uh, somebody else. Only well, haven't got a single thing to go on, Keys. He'll show. He's got to show. Sometime, somewhere, they've got to meet. Yeah, so um, that I, they kind of cut through the uh, like they had a bunch of different really good lines in that trailer, like some of the best lines. Yeah, so, um, um, does someone have a second? Does someone have a second? Uh, like they had a bunch of really good lines in that trailer, like some of the best lines. Yeah, so, yeah there's a, there's an echo somewhere. I don't know who's who's side that's on, but um, um. Yeah, so they cut through like a lot of the best lines. They like cut right from the uh, they didn't have the I didn't get the money and I didn't get the woman. The woman. They cut that one out and they <laughs> cut straight to the like sometimes murder can smell like honeysuckle, which are two lines that like they they cut through in the trailer that that don't um, <laughs> go together at all. Do you guys? Yeah, no, I mean it's like to drop some of the the best lines is kind of a drag. You know, it's like those yeah. are, those are classic lines. You know, they did get in at least four babies, which is good because, you know, you got to, got to make sure to, <laughs> this, this has got to be like, like, you could never do a drinking game for every time Fred McBurry says baby in this movie because you wouldn't make it through the movie, basically. Yeah. No, he calls her baby in every single, There's yeah. nobody puts baby in the corner, you know? No, I felt the same way when I went to New Orleans uh, a few years ago. Like everybody calls everybody else baby. And I just, I never thought a large black man would call me baby unless I went to prison. <laughs> Uh, yes, Eileen, please. Uh, we, 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 we. <laughs> okay. Um, right. Yeah, well, but it's doing that. It, it's the reason it's such a mess of a, of a hacked up. You know, they're trying for that speedy, cheap look that was actually kind of an exciting preview style. So all the kind of cuts yeah. and wipes and rapid. So, yeah, they don't care if you hear the whole line, I think. That's the style. <laughs> and it's kind of nice for the tawdriness of the film as a whole. which It really embraces a kind of California sleaze, which I think you can't admire too much. Which I think Star Wars kind of, you know, like borrowed some of that aesthetic with those, uh -huh. uh, with those wipes and uh -huh. everything, you know. Yeah. So, so you know, it's it's, you know, kind of nice to see mm -hmm. it, uh, in its in its natural habitat. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> it's it's yeah. It's, yeah. I hadn't thought of that, but that's a good comparison. Yeah. I was gonna say I was gonna say later on in um uh, Sunset Boulevard, I uh -huh. think Billy Wilder really yeah. leans into that California sleaze. Anyway, yeah. I should introduce that this is yeah. movie night extravaganza. Uh, we are talking about double indemnity. Um, this is the first of our chronological series on uh, noir films, movie noir extravaganza, our special, uh, you know, May season, I guess. Um, we have a bunch of them coming up. 
And uh, this is the first one that we're doing in chronological order. I think it makes sense that this is the first one. I, I, I pushed for this to be the first one because mm-hmm. um, I think it occupies a pretty special place in the chronology. Um, Absolutely. But uh, I'll introduce the panel right now. J. Andrew World, illustrator, artist, uh, you know, guy who has um, a, a neighbor making noise upstairs. <laughs> like, uh, for, breaking yeah. news. Yeah. <laughs> Not for long, because I'm moving. Oh, good. All because right. of the noise? Uh, <laughs> don't, answer, don't answer it. Yeah. <laughs> I no, because the there was a murder that took place uh, upstairs. And, and, and... <laughs> the murder was downstairs, but no. Wait. <laughs> um, actually... <laughs> All right, we have Conan Neutron, Protonic Reversal, and Conan Neutron, The Secret <laughs> Friends. Um, you know, I, I want to have you do a, ba- a Bandcamp shout out right now um, and, pr- and plug your album because we're going to be, you know, we're going to be going and, and now people have a chance to actually go grab it. And, uh, you know, later on tonight, right. Bandcamp Friday will be done. Bandcamp Friday, the holiest of holy days. <laughs> uh, the day where everybody re- is reminded that musicians are broke and maybe they should give them some money. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, Dangerous Nomenclature, the newest by Conan Neutron, The Secret Friends. Neutronfriends.bandcamp.com. It has been out digitally for a little bit, but mm-hmm. uh, we put the vinyl pre-order up, which is what people like to buy. And mm-hmm. who am I to question commerce? Uh, so <laughs> if you want to give me money, uh, as, <laughs> as well as the other fine folks involved, to split with the erratic retaliator strategy, because when you have that many words and that many band names, you really have to call it dangerous nomenclature. But of course, no, the real conceit of it is that mm-hmm. we, uh, we two very different bands wrote songs to the same song titles. And it's kind of, it's a pretty cool release. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, it's a limited edition. Uh, and yeah, went up today for Bandcamp Friday. And please buy it. Thank you. Please. Well, and- if this show stands for one thing, it's pro-commerce, you know? <laughs> And I exactly everyone, everyone, people are talking about more and more. It's really a paragon of capitalism that movie next to Afghanistan. I do also want to mention because I didn't mention when we were hosting This Is Revolution, but I mentioned on the after party that you can still sign the petition for Neutron at Night for me to get the uh, James Corden slot because he is retired. <laughs> so uh, that does mm-hmm. that is a copy still available, sort of ask as well. Um, mm-hmm. So, so exactly like dare to dream folks like dare mm. to dream. You can, you can do better. I, I, and you I'd should rather do. have that be our plan A. Cause the plan B obviously is throwing James Corden off a train. And <laughs> I... <laughs> we already did car crash karaoke on the after party. For Santa Town, so <laughs> we want to repeat ourselves. A thousand ways to kill James Corden. <laughs> uh, anyway, to put, to put it back on track, I'm very excited to talk about this. I, for, mm. I like the fact that it, we ended up doing it sequentially. And I think it's really cool that we're, that we're starting with this one, not, mm-hmm. not counting in China, town is actual canon because we technically mm-hmm. started with that one but for the show proper <laughs> and i'm very excited to have eileen back welcome Yay. back i'm excited to yeah. be back so, eileen jones film critic at jacobin magazine mm-hmm. my old uh you know place of employment um <laughs> for a while um and author of film suck usa and mm-hmm. uh co-host of a podcast also called film suck Yes, thank you for getting all that in. That's all very important. And I'm thrilled to be talking about this movie because I used to teach this movie. I teach a class on film noir at Berkeley. And this is such a definitive noir that you always started with this one. Because, you know, people are like, what's film noir? And you just throw it up there and then you can just go to town because it has almost every leading characteristic. So, fabulous. Barbara Stanwyck's ankle bracelet. (laughs) I was not prepared for so much ankle thirst. There was a lot. The ankle is like the leg in the 40s. The leg was like this weird erotic <laughs> the center that uh, it's never reclaimed, I don't think. Yeah. I He, he kind of mentions it so many times, though, the anklet, that it becomes yeah. kind of like almost pathological. Yeah. He's like, he's like, I remember that. I still the way remember it's that cutting anklet. into her ankle? Come on. It's cutting in. Come on. And meanwhile, it's shiny. Quentin, meanwhile, Quentin Tarantino's like, move down. Move down. <laughs> <I know. laughs> You're not really. All right, I want to see what I, I want to see what shoes she's wearing. I want to see yeah. that those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she's really sh- shiny and tawdry, so she, that's why she's got that crazy, that crazy distracting white blonde wig on that apparently some yeah. people didn't understand and were like, "Why does she have that? That's just a bad hairdo." And he's like, "It's supposed." Billy Wilder was like, "It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be sleazy and tawdry and bad. She has terrible taste." Yeah, I don't think people always get how low the world is supposed to be in this film. Maybe because it's old and that people look like they're dressed nicely. And maybe that doesn't play as well anymore as it would have then. 
Yeah. I, a, a lot of people, yeah, you're right. A lot of people really bagged on on the wig. And yeah, I think somebody wig. said like she looked like George Washington, which I assure <laughs> yes, you she did that's not. Right. That's she does right. not look like George Washington. <laughs> but you, at all. you get Barbara St- Stanwick and then you turn her into yeah. George Washington, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wander into the White House, you're like, why is there a big picture of Barbara Stanwyck? <laughs> Barbara uh, Stanwyck <laughs> on the wall. What the hell? <laughs> and yeah, which one she, was she? <laughs> <laughs> and she just gives, I mean, and you know, she's a brilliant actress. She's given she gives a million great performances. But this is, I don't think there's any argument. This is such a career high. Yeah. She just goes way, way out there on a limb. She's still terrifying, I think. Just I, I love the fact that she didn't want to do this movie. And Billy Wilder's like, um, yeah. you know, I dare you. <laughs> yeah, he, <laughs> nigged, he, like, yeah. Nigged, he nigged both of them into doing the movie. He was yes. Like, yes. I thought you were an actress. I think <laughs> Are you an actress or a mouse? Is the line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. And, and Fred McMurray is the story because only Billy Wilder could get these great performances out of him. And, and of course, Fred McMurray's great line is, but you need a real actor for this part. And he knew right. it. <laughs> in, in his okay. view of himself. He was not a real actor. He was a pleasant, amiable, jockish leading man in light romantic comedies. Yeah. So you can imagine how shocked to be offered this really meaty part. And he's so good. He's so good at playing like Great. a hollow man. You know, he's wonderful at that kind of. And movie. and the the sleaze. I mean, I'm happy you brought that up in in the first couple you know seconds of describing this because mm-hmm. I think it's interesting that I mean the film noir kind of that comes before this, like the pre-war mm-hmm. period, right? Like Maltese Falcon, mm-hmm. the movie that I talk about all the time apparently <laughs> <laughs> but like Maltese Falcon like um just really like the the private detective era of noir right like that mm-hmm. kind of um right from pulp novels into like right. uh you know the, like the seediest pulp novels but this takes it way farther down I feel like and you're in an even uh you know more seedy world because they're not like they're not law enforcement in any way shape or form they're literally just no. the people that like um take their jobs as insurance claim people like really, really seriously. <laughs> right, right. So it's like, so they, they kind of find the the same kind of private, private investigator cop kind of thing, but they're like, why don't we take this down to a point where it's literally just some guy being like, can we give you the money for this insurance claim or shouldn't we? And trying to sell you insurance. And I feel like that's yeah. kind of a, it's put into like such a weird box in the bottom. Like nobody wants insurance. Nobody uh-huh. wants to go door to door to their house and like sell them insurance. Like they're like, uh-huh. and you know, all of these, <laughs> Like, like the guy, um, uh, Mr. Diedrichson, the, the, you know, older, uh, husband is, you know, he's like, he's like, well, next year you try to sell me fire insurance and earthquake insurance and <laughs> like all these different insurance, uh, plans uh-huh. that he's like, I don't like, you're just fucking scamming me. Like, I know that. So right. it's kind of funny to have them be kind of the most disrespected of the, uh, possible, I guess, investigative profession. Uh, yeah. And I think this film really makes, I mean, it's, it starts with James M. Kane. He does Postman Always Ring Twice and Dublin Denmody within a couple of years of each other in the early mm-hmm. mid thirties. And he makes the insurance, you know, the insurance scams central to film noir. So uh, this goes on as a strand. If you watch DOA, if you watch Pitfall, if you want, there's a whole, there's insurance goes on as a thing in film noir. I think it's partly because it's such a, a perverse system. You're gambling <laughs> again, you know, about your your death, your loss of limbs, your your fire, your all your human calamities. You're you're kind of laying down money against what, and you can make money off the loss of some sort of life. So I think that's yeah. part of it. Why it fits in so perfectly in the film noir world. And it's amazing he got two that he got two books out of one murder case, the Ruth Snyder right. <laughs> murder case, where you know, a woman and her boyfriend try to kill the old the, the, the husband for uh, the for a, an insurance claim. Kind of Dublin. It's Dublin good value, situation. really. Very good value that. to get two bestsellers out of one <laughs> one trial, one notorious trial. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I think I mentioned it last time uh, when we did Nightmare Alley, but I yeah. think In a Lonely Place is also one to bring up because, again, not a mm-hmm. cop, not an investigator. Right? He's a screenwriter. Not a professional. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that's – I think some of my favorite noirs are ones that, like, go around that trope because i've seen so many of them and have like you know the the Seamus, you know the, mm-hmm. the, the the detective and i love those as well but i also love it when it's like oh yeah like billy wilder's like no we're not doing that here right like that's it's, great it, <laughs> it takes you away from structures of authority even though the right. private detective usually is is sort of outside mainstream authority too but still, you still got a connection to these systems. But when it's just some guy, some, some hapless guy like poor, poor Walter Neff, even the name Neff, geez, um, it just makes him. He thinks he's such. He thinks he's smart. He thinks he's 
a lady killer. He thinks he's all these things. And he thinks and, he's suave as hell. Like, and suave it, like, as hell. He's, he's kind of spitting out Absolutely these things. Absolutely not. And yeah. they're kind of discordant. Like, when he's like, I smell like honeysuckle. Who knew that murder could sometimes smell like honeysuckle? <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, coming out of like a noir mouth, you're like, you're like, you know, that kind of sounds cool. But then you think about it, you're like, it's a fucking weird thing to say into your, into your <laughs> yes. phone. Which, by the way, I was trying to explain what this, um, what the machine was. I made mm-hmm. sure to like write that because I, I was trying to explain when we did uh, our last after party. Right. I was trying to explain the dictaphone, and then I was yeah. like, I couldn't think of the word. And someone in he the was chat doing so like, very poorly. I might add. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know, and it was such. And we were giving him no assistance whatsoever. <laughs> I bet. I bet. The James well, now I know James. that it was invented by Alexander Graham Bell. Hey, hey. Oh and God. Dictaphone was the now actual you know brand much. of. <laughs> <laughs> and coming and, back with know, the that fact ate away, that ate away all of my <laughs> memories of chinatown i don't remember anything about chinatown i just remember the thing about the dictaphone the dictaphone yeah <laughs> and james That's m a- cam kane loved it and said it was such a great idea he wished he'd thought of it and nobody and james m kane never praised anyone who adapted his novels i think it was only <laughs> billy wilder who gets like the credit well, if you, so if you was, ever look at double watching... indemnity it's the craziest novel it has an ending that will just blow your mind. It's way more occult and lurid and insane. It's really off the chain. They literally throw themselves off a ship into shark-infested waters together. <laughs> That's the end. Like you do. So, yeah. Like you do. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, they really kind of calmed it down and made it a little more of a sense-making system. But they held on to a real portrait of just a world so tawdry. And you'll see critics still trying to debate, like, well, wait, why does he really do this? I mean... You know, by standards of today, anyway, it doesn't seem that sexy. It's kind of sexy. You have to assume it's the sex, like you always have to do in right. film noir. But there's a kind of cold, weird, is that really what's motivating him? And and people really debate like this. There's a Roger Ebert critic, I forget who it is, who goes on and on about like, you know, this movie really doesn't make any sense. I think it does if you look at how crappy the world is. Like all of a sudden he's yeah. like, you know what? This is finally interesting. <laughs> you know, I can yeah. think up a brilliant crime, a perfect crime plan, and then here's a hot babe. And it's even though he was doing well, you know, as a salesman, it's such a nothing world. It, that's why there's all those weird little squat characters, all those short little characters. Have you noticed? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. the elevator dude and the woman in the supermarket and Nettie the housemaid, and they're all these irritated, frustrated, weird mobile people. Who can't? Who kind of are nowhere in life, and they really. She needs Fred McMurray's help to get the uh, baby. To get the thing off the shelf. (laughs) The woman who says everything I want to buy is on shelves beyond my reach could stand for the whole way the world is being portrayed. You you get a little window into that world, just like a guy who's so proud to be from Medford and wants to talk about from Medford. Medford, He keeps repeating it over and over. I'm from Medford. I'm a Medford man. I'm (laughs) Medford Medford man. What I say, I mean. Yeah, like I feel like that, that character they try to pick like the most annoying possible person that you're like, oh my god, I just wanna I just wanna jump off this train and this guy is, <laughs> will not leave. Yes. But um there there's a line that I'm trying to find. I, I write down notes of like mm-hmm. just different lines every time we do something like this. And um I've, by like, the way, this is moving to extravaganza and that's for us. He didn't get to introduce himself, so <laughs> I rarely I rarely ever do. You rarely do, <laughs> yeah. Um no, so but he says he says something about how um, you know you, oh here it is um, in this business you can't sleep but figure out all the tricks they could pull on you like you're the guy behind the roulette, roulette wheel watching the customers so they don't crook the house mm-hmm. and one day you think about how you could crook the house better yourself right. and I, I think that that really um, and, and I just thought of this this connection now I didn't necessarily put this together mm-hmm. before this but you know I, I've always thought it was uh, keys. And that father, like, you know, father, son, weird relationship they have. And like, mm-hmm. obviously, like, you know, film scholars love to talk about how, you know, lighting the cigarette for the person yeah. is like a, you know, a homoerotic gesture. That's the real like love a, story here. Yeah. 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 Mm. Love so, story to like, cigarettes? <laughs> 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 they well, love their cigarettes. <laughs> they did love their cigarettes. <laughs> and lighting but, them in a cool way, like that, like yeah. flick of the, the, the th- and everybody knows I'm how right. to do it. I'm like, how does everybody know how to do this thing they that they all never smoked seen? like fucking <laughs> chimney? Well, I mean, first, they I just think all they did. used to make uh, matches better than they do now. I think so. Apparently, definitely. now apparently. I have a book of matches that I have to like use the oven for to like get them lit. Because they you have to light them like five times to get one that won't break. Or... Yeah, Except yeah. Like, yeah. Key, like... Keys at one point says that every time he puts matches in his pocket, they explode. They explode. Yeah, like, which I want exploding matches. <laughs> but like. Some, some, like he has to be so like wound up tight, I guess. Like, right? Like mm. that's supposed to be that. Like he lights the matches somehow himself. Like his body lights the matches for him when he puts them in his pocket. Right, 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 but right. um, 
No, so I, I think it's interesting though. He gets completely shit on by Keys. Um uh -huh. and he, he says it like a different line. He says, I was trying to think with your brain. And Keys wants to hire him, obviously, as his assistant and dock mm. his pay, which yeah. dude, that's not how you sell it. That's not how you sell it. Yeah. He's like, he's like, you're gonna make significantly less money. But what yeah. you will have is is time at a desk to is really the saddest here's all the reasons <laughs> why i want you to do this okay i know well, that sounds terrible <laughs> but, it, it, but it kind of feels like he, he calls he's like saying that a salesman is like a glad hander and a back yeah. slapper and he's really just demeaning the guy's profession and it seems Absolutely. like um you're too good to be a salesman a peddler like he's using all these like you know the worst terms and then he's like mm -hmm. um to me a claims man is well, i'll try to do it in the um no i can't do that yeah <laughs> just think of but Ralph Wiggum. <laughs> those pencils are scalpels and bone chisels. Um, uh -huh. and those papers are not just forms of statistics and claims for compensation. They're alive. They're packed with drama. <laughs> so you know he, he's he's shooting on his profession while boosting up the investigative side of it. And it mm -hmm. seems almost like he's like this guy is kind of demeaning me all the time to the point where I'm trying to prove that I can do the perfect crime, and he mm -hmm. isn't going to be able to figure it out. And then obviously he mm -hmm. panics as soon as he does it. Mm -hmm. But there's like this that father-son dynamic i think that he's like trying to slay the father almost you know what i mean and like it has to come mm -hmm. from the fact that this guy is just like he, when he's sitting on the thing at the end he's like can i can i say something about myself and he's like i'm just really good at this and it's like <laughs> maybe there's some there's some part of his brain that's like i want to just like i want to destroy this guy's sense of self like uh -huh. he, he almost yeah. gets away with it too and then he like uh -huh. he has to make sure that he like that keys knows it's him like <laughs> Yeah, and there, I, I agree that there's something much seamy, there's something more seamy and complex going on than than the tip. The, the, it's really a very popular reading now that that the true, t you know, for people who don't even want to get Freudian, it's it's a just a touching love story between you know the the moral figure who's keys and the you know the immoral figure. I'm just like you are. What movie are you watching? <laughs> sure, keys is, is that a remake? <laughs> yeah, it's keys from is from such a crazy. It's dude. triple indemnity. <laughs> He's yeah. like totally limited. He's so obsessive and paranoid from from yeah. this job he does. That's all he really cares about. That he's about to get married to a woman, and he has her investigated and finds out what what does Neff say? She's a tramp from a long line of tramps, and you just can tell yeah. he 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 can't yeah, he has, really. He has have... all these things that I I wrote these out too. He has all these things that he lists off. He goes mm -hmm. um and the stuff that came out. She was, I, I can't do that. She was dying her hair ever since she turned 16. Yeah. There was a manic depressive in her family. She already had yeah. one husband. He was a professional pool player in Baltimore yeah. and her brother. And then yeah. he goes, yeah, I get it. She was a tramp from a long line of tramps. Uh, tramp. But yeah. it's like all small things. There's that, like, nothing damning there. Yeah. You know? He says yeah. things like, I bet she drinks from the bottle. You know? Yeah. Like, check, just check, check, check. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, there's almost like a, I don't even want to call it fatherly, like almost motherly, like nothing he does is good enough like yeah you know your, yeah, your yeah. job isn't good enough like you're not good enough i thought you were smart you know like i you're but just you're tall just you're tall. not smart like and you're just tall yeah you're just a little taller absolutely yeah 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 <laughs> and, then, well, it, and yeah also he says it about everybody else it's like everybody in this office is stupid i'm smart mm -hmm. i'm smarter than everyone in this office everyone right. in this office you know doesn't know what they're doing the boss the boss in that giant office over there he doesn't know what he's doing he's shitty at it you know what well, i mean well in like, that case though he's right <laughs> <laughs> he is yeah. right. Is it one of the great fair showing fair. boss scenes? That wonderful <laughs> monologue. You know, Edward G. Robinson just makes a meal of this monologue. The suicide <laughs> statistics. That must have been a bitch to memorize. And he just does a the most brilliant takedown of the whole theory of suicide in the in the case, just because he's memorized actuarial tables. It's insane. So he, in other words, he practically lives there. You 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 assume he actually probably sleeps there. That's his whole life. So he can't have an ordinary life with anyone else. Yeah, you're right. Other than this kind of strange, maybe sort of father son thing that he's got going on, and it's still somewhat abusive <laughs> with Neff that he wants <laughs> Neff to be like him. Um, so when you do have the triangle, the kind of love triangle, if you will, when they're posed next to the door, she shows up to the apartment while he's in the apartment talking to Keys, and he has to hold the door open to cover her, and they're all, he's between the two. You know, their shots really underscoring. You know, he can go one way, he can go another. But what people don't point out is neither is a good way. <laughs> Keys' way of life is not a good life. That's not a great yeah. life. Yeah, it's, so. it's the it's that kind of obsessive uh professional yeah. way of life that like yeah. but like it's not even a good profession though that's like you know what i mean like because you can see yeah, someone it's being called like grinding a... for us you should try it sometime <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was the originator of hustle culture 
<laughs> yeah, it's like the, the, the neoliberal forefather keys. Right, exactly. <laughs> Who loves the idea that you live at work, you know, because then, you know. Yeah, he was the first PMC. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so yeah, I think that's that's important. I mean, I just don't think people want to fully embrace the crumminess of the vision. And you know, Billy Wilder's gonna take it even further. Not only is Sunset Boulevard the continuation, but Ace in the Hole, which did terribly, oh, yeah. absolutely failed at the box office. You want to talk about a vicious film that's quite rightly vicious. Like everyone almost in that film is absolutely appalling, except the guy who's buried under the mountain and is going to die. <laughs> He's going to be sacrificed to, to create a story for a newspaper, for a corrupt newspaper man. So he had this vision that I think he, he really wanted to pursue to the limit, but Ace in the Hole took him into a territory where he just fails and Billy Wilder didn't usually fail. So I think, you know, Double Indemnity is on that same continuum, but for some reason... <laughs> For some reason, people don't want to see it in its darkest terms. Though my godson watched it for the first time, and he was like, this is such a fucked up movie. I can't believe this movie. He was shocked. <laughs> he was truly shocked. And it's a mean, it's a mean movie. It's more than yeah. just a fucked up movie. It's because yeah. sometimes you see a fucked up movie and it's like, you know, they're kind of playing with it. This is mm. a, a downright kind of cruel, mean um, yeah. interpretation of this thing. And mm -hmm. I think... I think it's fascinating that obviously uh billy wilder's usual writing partner is charles brackett mm -hmm. and charles brackett wanted nothing to do with this he's like mm -hmm. you know they wanted to make more fun stuff so he had raymond chandler as his co-writer mm -hmm. on this and had an incredibly you have to imagine that he's kind of the keys to uh to, to <laughs> raymond chandler's neff like he's a he's kind of this obsessive guy who lived this life like i was watching a documentary of billy wilder's life and he's just kind of like living alone in this apartment at the end of his life and like mm -hmm. talking through his writing process and stuff i have a video of it actually mm -hmm. but like he always has to be writing with somebody and mm -hmm. uh you know raymond chandler would go into the bathroom i guess and and drink and he was an alcoholic <laughs> like a just what like complete alcoholic and um <laughs> And so they ended up hating each other so much that when this movie was nominated for an Oscar, he did not invite Raymond Chandler to get the uh, best adapted screenplay nomination. <laughs> yeah, really. And then wrote well, his next movie about Raymond Chandler, like pretty much <laughs> last throwing weekend, shade right? at the yeah. last weekend, yeah. all about yeah. an alcohol, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. having the DTs. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I mean, the only way that Billy Wilder had more of a life is he had a very, very active sex life. And that was one of the things Raymond Chandler was oddly prudish about. He couldn't stand that Billy Wilder was always on the phone making dates constantly. And and that just drove Raymond Chandler. He just thought that was so offensive. So you know, it was it was a kind of like okay. Billy Wilder something. was a Chad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. But he bragged about having him, been a gigolo back in Germany. No one knows if that's really true. But then if you see him, he like doesn't look. You know what I mean? Like he's a, he's no. a very slight man and like a very uh kind of big glasses, nerd, like, yeah, <laughs> very like managerial like looking man. And then yeah, he is. Yeah, but you know Germans really do like their. Um, <laughs> that's exactly there's a whole kink about that that's exactly kind of that kind of man <laughs> yeah uh, taking us away from that uh, mm. i, I kind of get the impression that that neff uh sort of i talked about this a little bit when i went on uh, amy and amanda's show uh these are bad movies and talked about um the uh, uh inside man the mm -hmm. spike lee movie mm -hmm. and the fact that like i was like who amongst us you know, hasn't sit there and like planned out a bank robbery or something along those lines, right? Now think about the fact that if you're an insurance investigator and all you see is people trying to like get away with it and things along those lines, right? So of course he probably <laughs> he probably was <laughs> working it out, like gaming it out in his head for a long time. Cause mm -hmm. the thing that got me the most is like it doesn't take much motivation for like, yeah, let's kill him. And and oh what, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Like it's sort of like man, how long have you known this broad? Like a day? Right, like what? Right, <laughs> like right. you're ready to go. All right. right yeah. So like, it seems I, I, could like never, I could never do something like that. Oh, I thought about it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll, I'll, <laughs> exactly. I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah, <man>. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very, in that way, it is very like Double Indemnity. Double Indemnity, the novel, is very shocking in that it really is like, well, she's a cute chick. Nice bod. I guess I'm committing murder now. It just yeah. slides <laughs> right in. And again, I think it's just part of this like, Nobody's got a lot of moral structure. Even Keys has got a kind of professional obsession. But yeah. this is like a world where, yeah, it seems like there's nothing stopping a Walter Neff from the slide. And yes, he gets so engaged once he's planning, once he's planning it. It's got to be perfect. 
It's got. It's like he wants almost to create his own work Break of down art. The line. He's finally in, you know, <laughs> to, to to getting it exactly right. And it is a very smart plan. But of yeah, course, it's, it's like a Columbo movie nowhere. almost. It's like a what? <laughs> Columbo movie, you yeah. know. <laughs> and they show you the perfect crime, and then Columbo, you know, just one more thing yeah. his way through the uh, to the end. Um, yes, solving yes. it. Yeah, if it hadn't been for the little man inside keys who gets hunches. Which, That's another which, great yeah, thing. Columbo. All of the professional acumen is not is nothing compared yeah. to this insane instinct he's got, and yeah. they, that's re that recurs in Touch of Evil. I think it's a tribute, sure. basically, um, with with Orson Welles's character playing someone who what is it? His bum leg hurts him or something, and that's how yeah. he knows things. Um, yeah. So the same kind of crazy, instinctive. It isn't even a rational thing. That's just how he knows, which I like. And it, well, you know, you know, literally, literally, how he knows in uh, Touch of Evil. Mm. <laughs> well, fake fair, fair. <laughs> yes, we won't. <laughs> yes, very true. But um, it's a little bit of that kind of how do we even know things? And you know, knowing actuarial tables isn't really it. It's these. It's it. You yeah. know, Fillmore gets into a lot of this fate versus chance stuff. You know, is it fated to happen? Is it an chance? Is it like, what are the mo big motivating forces is in this insane dark world? And it, of course, it never arrives at any kind of answer. So you're always being being kind of pulled back and forth in the in, trying to figure out what's how is how is this crazy world working? Which I, was one of the things I admire most about it. It's um, it's it takes as a basic thing, most of the great noir, that it's just an insane world where it's not just corruption that's bad or criminality that's bad or or all sorts of post-war malaise, whatever you want to say. There's something fundamentally wrong and weird in the world, in the workings of the world. And some of yeah. the good ones get borderline occult with that kind of stuff. And and I think that it's kind of fascinating for the reason that there's the Hayes Code, right? You can't really mm -hmm. criticize right. the government. You can't like it's war, like you know it's the middle of uh, World War II, like it's mm -hmm. 1944 when this comes out. Like you yeah. can't really just be like, hey, like the cops are corrupt, the government's corrupt. You know, mm -hmm. America kind of fucking sucks right now. Like right. you can't like you can't have those conversations. Mm -hmm. So taking it out of the uh, public sector, I guess taking it out of yeah. the government structure and throwing it into this you know this insurance world, which. Um, you can investigate, but then, I mean, the, the status, I guess you never get the, really the satisfaction of like arresting somebody that, you know, of, 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 like, you have to call the cops again and be like, Hey, can you guys handle this and arrest this person? I think there's a murder. Like, mm. So taking it out of that sphere though, you can completely <laughs> say, Hey, this is a, an incredibly corrupt institution because it's a private insurance company. Mm -hmm. It's not a, you know, it's not a government institution. It's not law enforcement, which you could still kind of say, Oh well, you know, cops are either bad in this world or there's mm. some bad cop, like the bad apples thing. Uh -huh. Like you could do things like that, but like you know, you had to really, really walk that tightrope that I don't think Billy Wilder wanted to walk. So kind of taking it and putting it into this, um, the private sector, I guess, right. kind of makes it incredibly fascinating. Well, and making it really bad. People pay their monies expecting to get a big payout, but the whole operation of the company is to make sure no one gets a payout. Exactly. Yeah, and they're very. That's incredibly frank about that. It's so there is a, it's a scam. Yeah, it's, it's a huge scam, really. Which yeah. is where the uh, the roulette card metaphor comes in, right? Mm -hmm. Where he's like, you know, you're trying to bet against the house, and I bet mm -hmm. I could bet against the house better than, or you know, cheat yeah. the house better than the other people because I actually am, you know, I have that extra leg up where I'm literally working, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. in the house. I know how that kind of works, so I can kind of um, track my plan based on that. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously you know, not expecting that there's some kind of a cult level to it where this guy mm. just has like the killer instinct where you can kind of just go, you know what? I think there's something off here and be like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you think of the, I've been meaning to ask you one of my favorite parts about the movie is the op the crazy opening of the credit sequence yeah. where it's just a silhouette of a guy in crutches crutching forward to the screen till he blacks out the screen. And it's really ominous. And there's this great, I don't know how you say his name, M Miklos Rosa. I think that's how you say it. The guy who does the score and it really makes his career in a, in a big way in America. Um, but that's all that's happening. So it's this very yeah. long crutching <laughs> forward from all the way the hell back, all the way up until it's black. And I've always been fascinated by that. That's an it's it's the only thing that tops it is another Billy Wilder movie where the whole of Sunset Boulevard is or no ace in the hole. You're staring at dirt. All the whole credit <laughs> sequence is over <laughs> is over dirt. <laughs> exactly. So he was very bold about stuff like that. But I love that opening. I think it's brilliant. So, do you want to hear my well, theory of what it, why it's why it's all yes, cool? Yes, of course we do. <laughs> so we want to hear okay. Andy talk about some unrelated topic. Yes, 
<laughs> well, that could you could just cut in at any time. <laughs> that that comes in for free whether you want it or not. So. <laughs> because <laughs> in silhouette, it's both Walter Neff and the guy he's killing, Mr. Dietrichson. Okay, so but why is that so creepy and ominous? It's this figure of someone who's impaired on crutches, so that shouldn't be that scary. But he's both the the murderer and the victim combined into two things. Uh, yeah, I like that. Into into and one, it's also, two and I, one. I think it's also disorienting, right? Like you can't yeah. really tell what's going on, and you see someone and they're like handicapped and, and you know, yes, in this space, and, and they're, they're kind of, and this they're and they're inexorably coming towards you in this horrifying way. But yeah, it's but this. I also think it's there's something about the pitifulness, the, the limit, the 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 smallness, the tottering, the badness, the impaired, that I think is is really haunting and part of what's kind of scary. You feel I feel, always feel uneasy about the image, like it's borderline scary, and you don't even know what it's about yet. You know, and even when you find it out, you're kind of like, why is that so? That's a really creepy ass image. So I like that he really gets that kind of complexity going, even in something as simple as that. That's really. It. Prime. And you don't really, I mean, one of the things I find fascinating about this movie is you don't ever mm -hmm. see the murder happen, right? Like you watch yeah. her face. You briefly. watch it, it's all on her face. Yeah. And you hear the noises, like the choking noises very, very briefly. Like he mm -hmm. instantly, I don't like, however, you must just instantly <laughs> suffocate him, but you hear yeah. it for like that one second he, you know, and then yeah. it cuts. And, and it's another censorship thing, of course. I mean, it took him 10 yeah. years to be able to make this damn thing. So censorship. But putting it on her face is so great because then you want to read her face. And what is her face saying? I mean, it's an amazing little scene. But you've almost, you've almost, I think between that part of it, like mm -hmm. rewatching this and it being ominous, yeah. uh, between that part of it, knowing that that happened, but not actually ever seeing it kind yeah. of makes the crutches more ominous. And also um, mm -hmm. the, there's kind of the fact that... Um, uh, in the beginning, when you first see him, he's already dripping with sweat and he's been shot and he's like on his way out. He's dying. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I think that like going straight from that limping to that. So, you know, after everything, like the mm. end of the movie, pretty much first, um, mm. which, you know, Sunset Boulevard is another movie that kind of he's dead by the like, he's, he's dead narrating wall. You know, he's yeah. like speaking from he's the voice of God. Which, it shows yeah. you the very beginning that's like, hey, guess how this turns out? You know, yeah, <laughs> not great for this guy. Which yeah. is so great about film noir that so many of the best of them they just foreclose any possible way out, any possible happy ending, and they just tell you right up front. It's happened. all about some doomed person, doomed or dead or whatever, <laughs> contemplating how they got that way. I mean, that is bold. I, can you believe how successful film noir was in its time? It was a thriving <laughs> genre. God, we'd pass out if we had a constant stream of this kind of film coming out. It was fabulous. Yeah. Um, DOA, I don't think this is a particularly good film noir, mm. but like it, it's interesting to have it also be like, hey, listen, I've yeah. gotten poisoned. And, I'm and poisoned. I'm, tell you, I'm telling you the story as fast as I can, but yeah. just know <laughs> right. I'm dying. No, again. I'm <laughs> dying. <laughs> and there's die. no antidote. There's no last minute save. It's like, no, he's really going to die. Yeah. And he <laughs> runs around and he, I like when he staggers up against Life magazine <laughs> and rows and rows and rows is all that kind of hilarious stuff. Yeah. I still am a fan of that just because, again, it's just a bold concept that they just drive home like doomed doom 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 all it's the time almost like time. uh when hitchcock did uh rope or whatever and he did mm -hmm. the you know that kind of thing where he tried to do the whole movie just with one like right yeah one one shot, shot. Like, and yeah, it's yeah. it's very creative <laughs> very how 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 it was put together too because it really does like your heart pressed to be like was that did he do it? But the point is, if you're not like a film nerd, uh, uh, like looking for those things, you're just right. like, oh, wow, this movie is really interesting. Notice. Yeah. You have All to right. notice every time he dollies in on somebody's back. Basically. Exactly. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, yeah. but he's moving around so much, it's not that noticeable. He's always passing. Right. So, yeah, it's very. It's like I, constant again, movement. That he that Hitchcock felt like he was that just that just that good that he could be like, you know <laughs> what? Let's tie my hands behind my back and one foot. Let, how hard can we make this? Let's right. do lifeboat. Let's do another one where we can't move anywhere. Um, yeah, that's that's really chutzpah, man. <laughs> that's some serious. Color. I mean, you know, the, the closest I think in another film mm -hmm. noir that comes to anything. I mean, like there's the continuous shot that uh, Orson Welles does where he tries to break the record for that eight mm -hmm. minute shot and touch right. evil. Yeah, and it's referenced in the player, which we talked about. Uh -huh. right? Yeah, like that it's right, like right, homage, right. like yeah, and talked right. about on the movie while they are doing it, which yeah. I think is pretty <laughs> hilarious for that. Movie. Yeah, that's right. I haven't seen that in years, God. I really enjoyed that <laughs> back then. But yeah, did yeah. they specifically say it was X minutes long, and so it's got to be longer than the X minutes thing? Is that what they mm -hmm. do? I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it's like eight minutes and thirty-seven seconds yeah. or something. Yeah. And you got to so. beat it. 
I well, almost, and uh, it starts with an explosion. That and doesn't it start with an explosion? No, it goes to the end. There's an inter the interracial kiss, and then an explosion. That's right. Immediately, that's, right. that's yeah. just some nice clever. Come on, I you know I would like some more clever. I don't know. Might seem cheap, but I'm like we this we've got some boring ass cinema. I'm sorry. We need we bold. so we we each had a, a two movies that we were kind of um, mm -hmm. fighting like with ourselves, wrestling with ourselves about putting in the two that I. Uh, was wrestling over putting into this film mar uh, month mm -hmm. where um one of them was third man one of them was touch of evil and i mm -hmm. ended up deciding that i was going to go with third man mm -hmm. we're gonna do that on tuesday but mm -hmm. um but yeah touch night of, of the hunter over, over here by the way night oh the god that, they're also good but yeah night of the hunter yeah, yeah, yeah. drifter wow <laughs> that's one to <laughs> reckon with and that one's really divisive i thought anyone who saw that movie would love it and be blown away and then i showed it to a class and a lot of people were like he yeah, Matthew Film like Guy gave it real low ratings, and I'm just like, what's up with yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, Char Thank there's you. Charles Lawton being a genius in the only time he directs, and it's that's the end of his directing <laughs> career. Just really shocking. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, so I, I think that, like, Billy Wilder is a, is a similar director to someone mm -hmm. like Orson Welles or Hitchcock in the way that mm -hmm. he kind of um, – it's kind of a, a boundary-pushing um, – act right like filmmaking itself needs to be a boundary pushing act like yeah it can't just be um you know he just makes something fun i mean you know a lot of his work is other kinds of boundary pushing like some like it hot obviously is mm -hmm. a pretty pretty controversial for the time but like mm -hmm. i remember seeing that a bunch of times when i was a kid but um yeah like this this film is completely different uh in in the way that it kind of um pushes the boundaries i think of what's acceptable kind of the dark mm -hmm. world that you're allowed to really show mm -hmm. um the, the sexuality of it, which I don't think, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, it's tawdry, but it's also, um, like, it's kind of like, it's, it's lame sexuality, because I don't think that's really the point of it, right? Like, he's just kind of thirsting after, uh, you know, or seeming like he's thirsting after Miss mm -hmm. Dedrickson, but like, as the film goes on, it kind of unravels where it's like, now he doesn't really give a fuck about her, and she doesn't really give right. a fuck about him. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of this... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she and Miss ankles. Yeah, Lola. Yeah, he's an ankle guy. That's right. If she'd wear an anklet, it'd all be different. But yeah, Lola <laughs> yeah. is the only character who's supposed to be like the sympathetic one. But even with that, they give her this nasty boyfriend. That in the end, they sort of are yeah. trying to say, well, maybe he's better than he looks. Let's give him a trance. But he even looks like a vicious little prick. He really does. Um, he's a, he's so Tony Italian. Soprano would be. Yeah. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah. 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 Like, like, he's, <laughs> he's gonna use him to murder her too, which is which is amazing. Yes, yes. He's been But like not but not in a way that is like, oh, let's plan out a murder. Like he she he, she's just gonna go, hey, I bet this guy will kill his girlfriend if I say, Oh, he's he's like she's cheating on you. Yeah, here's where she is. And so, like yeah. that's like almost like a wild animal attack or something like that. Like right. She's, that's like, right. Jesus Christ. And he looks like, you know, pretty capable of it. So that, I mean, there's yeah. that kind of, you know, the Mr. Dietrichson victim character. I forget the name of the guy they cast, but he's wonderful because he's so unappealing. I mean, he's just such a kind of nasty, irritable, petty little, little guy. He's got that nasty laugh. He's just, he's a creep. Tom so like, Powers. Oh, Tom Powers, Tom Powers. That's right. Okay. I know I've seen him in other stuff, but this is like, you know, he's probably his great performance. And, and so... You just, you kind of hunt around for any relief. And again, there's even in smaller, like, characters that normally you'd read sympathetically. Like the guy, the first guy that who talks to Walter, who's in the running the elevator in the, the insurance company. And he does that weird thing where he's like, how's the insurance business? They won't sell me any because there's something loose in my heart. And then yeah. he giggles, or they say, it, and he does that weird little laugh. <laughs> and, yeah. and so it's just got that wonderful, just gargoyles that you encounter all through, through the movie, which is another favorite part of film noir. Film noir is the best for just one-off scenes with people, characters you're never going to see again. They're hugely memorable, usually because they're absolutely bizarre. And so there'll be some a set of bizarre characteristics shoved in your face in one scene, and then they disappear. That's also a kind of daring way of doing a kind of sideways critique of this culture. It's just like, look how many warped, bizarro people um, right. there are who are also discontented, also hapless. It's an, there's an amazing number, and this is you know not very sensitive, but it's so unusual for the time. So many people have physical impairments in film noir. You just yeah. Well, there's a through line to that, Over right? and over and over. Yeah, absolutely. Like, 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 like David Lynch. Look at like mm -hmm. you know Quentin Tarantino. Like lots absolutely. of modern directors like have taken that aspect of it, even mm -hmm. if they're not doing like a noir type thing. They do the thing right. of like just having these, you know, uh, 
<laughs> baby shoes for sale never worn kind of level short story right like going right. on like what is what's what's that person's deal right right and um yeah exactly often no no explanation they just appear this somehow gone. You, you find out and then they are disappeared yeah, and and yeah. you really don't see that you don't see that much at all anymore um yeah in fact we're our our, our character actor game is very weak i think in most yeah well, because th I mean, this is a separate conversation kind of mm -hmm. yeah I, I was gonna say like there, there are some directors that do it but i feel like character actors have now become you know your, your leading men and leading ladies and character actors are now the same thing whereas before mm -hmm. they used to be very different things and that, mm -hmm. that's that's a very different and very involved conversation that i don't mm -hmm. want to take us off track for but all right well, I, think, I think also though there's a lot of character actors that end up employed mm -hmm. in uh tv um not so much mm -hmm. in movies right like mm -hmm. I, I think that there's that's a lot point. of yeah, yeah, so I think that there's probably there's hundreds of um character actors that kind of have like an interesting face and stuff. Mm. I'm sure they end up on like, Walter you know, Goggins. Like he yeah, was supposed exactly. to get justified for like one one or two episodes, and they're and like, "This is just, just the round. first episode." <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, crazy. he's someone who could story. you could put him in a yeah. film noir of the 40s oh. and 50s, and he would mm -hmm. just fit right in. That skull. Put, face you wouldn't bat an eyelash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Both, um, yeah. Well, both Jonathan Banks and um and Bob Odenkirk were only supposed to be on uh, Breaking mm -hmm. Bad for like three or four episodes, mm -hmm. and both of them and both now. So I mean, now they have Better Call Saul. They have their whole entire own universe right. because, yep. like, it was just such a, a good mm -hmm. combination. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan Banks is another like is 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 someone I think who could completely be in any uh, era of film that you could, mm -hmm. like that you could pretty much oh, put him 100%. in. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, he just has absolutely. that interesting kind of tough guy face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember what he was in. I I can't remember what he was in as a, like a younger person, and then I remember. Oh, he's been all it. kinds of and, dude. Uh, like that guy was in Gremlins. I mean, like he was like in all kinds of stuff. You know, like he was in like he was always like, hey, we need an extra like cop or something, right? And mm -hmm. then like he would be like that that sort of. Yeah, he's been in a, a bunch of things though. He's um mm -hmm. that and like he was always a that guy to me. Oh, it's that guy. I like that guy. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> like the the that guy sort of roles is like what Jonathan Banks would be. Also, mm -hmm. no, his first clear, appearance was he, airplane. Apparently, oh, he, he was wow. an airplane. Yeah. Um, wow! 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 He was in Community. Wow. He was in the show Community, which people yeah, think he was one of the later seasons. But it's oh. like it's like oh yeah, I forgot he was he was in this show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he was in and he was in Buckaroo Banzai. Mm -hmm. He was in Buckaroo. When we watched Banzai. that, I'm, I'm I was trying to see. There was a movie that I remember. Maybe it was Buckaroo Banzai that I was uh, mm. thinking that he was in, but. I feel like there was something that I saw him in a yeah, long he's, time he's ago. Younger. Was like, he's younger than that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, have you seen Righteous Gemstones with the with the performance by M. Emmett Walsh, who's got to be 90? Yes. As the, as the, as the, as I thought the he was dead. Father? I know. He, he's <laughs> old as hell. He looks really, really, really old. But he's right yeah, in I there. Mean, he so definitely looks it. Being brilliant as always. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Everybody, that is such an ensemble show. Everyone oh, my God. Is. Sleazy. And another show that Walter Goggins absolutely uh, yes, Walter Goggins. Kills it. Baby Billy, <laughs> Baby Billy, yeah, that's right, that's right, that's absolutely. right. <laughs> <Baby Billy. laughs> well, one yeah, thing Beverly Hills Cop, he was in that too. Yeah, sorry, oh. I'm, still I'm still on Jonathan Banks. My bad. No, <laughs> all right, carry on, carry on. We, we should dig. We should dig further into the, the Banks file. <laughs> this is a new. This is a new Jonathan Banks podcast. This is the. Uh... No, so there was definitely something that i wanted to bring up with this that i haven't touched on i'm trying to remember mm. um what it was in this well I, yeah can you think of it if not i have one yeah no go ahead i just the just the cinematography that's so venetian blind it's it's insane it's the most venetian blindy movie and you, you can tell that it was influential because you know that the yeah turns up everywhere um, so it, it's, it's John Seitz doing this and he, he, go, his career goes back to like, he was 11 and he was some sort of lab assistant um, on, on SNA films, like when he was a kid and, and he, he managed to do amazing things. It's not the showiest, you know, kind of low key lighting, uh, incredible trapping patterns, all that jazz, but it's still really bold and there are really, really memorable shots and there's some wonderful like location shooting things and it's pretty early. I mean, they start doing a lot of that after the war, but it's 44 and they're already out there on railroad tracks and doing night for night shooting. That's like pitch black, you know, when they're trying yeah. to, you know, throw them on the tracks and all that. That's a really striking scene. So he, he's doing a lot of bold stuff that's going to just become, you know, standard practice. Um, you know, there's that wonderful and I've never heard of this. 
uh, I think this is a widely reported one, when he and Billy Wilder decide to throw some sort of particulate matter into the air inside of the Dietrichson home to make oh, it look yeah. like, like there's dust hanging in the air in the slatted, you know, sun rays that are coming in. And you can really see it. It's and and then, you know, Sunset Boulevard is another movie that Billy Wilder uh, seems to do something similar to that, right? Uh, like, like, I feel like I feel like this movie is kind of almost a prototype for that in a lot of ways. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, like her house in Sunset Boulevard is just so full of like cobwebs and dust. And mm -hmm. so in this movie, kind of, it's almost it like creates a, that a, sense of chiaroscuro that you keep wanting to talk about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, like, and take, I think, yeah. yeah. Take a I drink. Mean, no, <laughs> oh, <it's my> <laughs> oh no <laughs> well so so i think that also um something kind of fascinating that i noticed uh watching it this mm -hmm. time because i've watched this movie a bunch of times but mm -hmm. um this time kind of uh the amount of darkness um obviously he's sitting in the dark office talking mm -hmm. to the dictaphone right. and you and it cuts between um the narration uh with him talking into the dictaphone and explaining mm -hmm. his, his thing and using all mm -hmm. his corny lines and then obviously flipping towards you know a lot of it it's daylight but then once the murder happens it's nighttime mm -hmm. so like the, the difference in the lighting i think is really fascinating mm -hmm. and the fact that they choose from the very beginning um which makes sense but he's just dripping with sweat he's just like mm -hmm. a very wet boy he's a very wet boy talking <laughs> into this dictaphone and yeah. it's and and every time you kind of forget that you're watching the story and this is the inevitable result of it and that he mm -hmm. probably doesn't get away with it right like you, like he's clearly dying from the moment you see him yeah and yeah, yeah. every time kind of the story lags a little bit or like uh you know changes um it flips right to him once again like sweating and and, and the blood spot sleeves. getting bigger on his coat yeah 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 so he's wet in many ways that boy yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah and you know again pretty well known but it is interesting that billy wilder shot the the gas chamber sequence yeah, Werewolf and then they, they lost to, it, right? Or they, and then he just decided it lost it. Couldn't. it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, he just said, "Oh, that's right, the footage. We don't. We have an image or two, I think, but we don't have the footage." I have, I have a, a clip of him talking about it. Oh, great! Um, and he'll show it to you if you join the oh. Patreon. Matt. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this is Billy Wilder explaining it on the AFI. Mm. Uh, have you ever shot more than one ending for a film? Yes, I have. Uh, I have. Uh, I have shot an ending which I chopped off, like in Double Indemnity. I had, I had an ending uh, uh, where where uh, Mr. McMurray was uh, executed in the gas chamber, and there was a kind of a thing between him and uh, Eddie Robinson, who was watching it. Then, as I was uh, proceeding with the picture, I found a scene uh, uh, where he tries to. After Robinson realizes that McMurray is the murderer and bleeding and uh, and to, wants to go to the elevator and kind of get into his car and go to Mexico or something. And uh, he collapses there, you know, and uh, can't even light the match anymore the way he always did. And, uh, and uh, in the distance, you heard already the siren of the police uh, car, the ambulance. So you knew what the outcome is going to be. And I ended it there because it was very anticlimactic. You know, he didn't need now. We knew that he was guilty. He confessed. We knew that how the two men felt about each other. It was, uh, it was, uh, uh, um, usually I, I have just uh, one ending, not necessarily the best, but uh, that's uh, all I should. But sometimes I, I, uh, I, uh, I shoot very little celluloid. I, I, I don't have, I don't have, uh, I don't have too, uh, too many, uh, 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 possibilities of fiddling around with it. I should have more said that, but uh, it's it's so hard to get, and I want to get out of there. I want to get away from them. It's cool. The audience for that looks like a Scorsese movie. I was gonna say, what was the <laughs> long, long held shot on the porn star in the fifth row, or whatever? What the hell was that? <laughs> hey, what the fuck? Oh, hey. <laughs> well, they're trying to, you know, it's it's AFI, and you know, they're really trying to do some experimental stuff with how they shoot audiences and and their, you know, their Apparently. talks. There, yeah. <laughs> they want to legitimize Ron Jeremy's acting career. <laughs> Apparently, man. Fair. Fair. Somebody had a crush. <laughs> Jesus. Um. No, but I, so I, I think that's you know. Because they have images uh, still of of that second ending, and they have mm. the image. I mean, it's kind of a famous image of of Keys watching him as they turn on the gas, mm. and 
there's multiple people on the gas chamber and which by the way i was always wondering um like when they stopped doing the gas chamber as a means of execution and i assumed it was um because of the holocaust it was not they stopped doing it in the 70s they kept mm. executing people by gas chamber for like 30 years after after uh world war ii ended mm -hmm. yep so uh where are all the pro-lifers on that <laughs> Well, yeah, they think they, they think the remarkably silent. Like, <laughs> the, yeah. the 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 pro life thing that people I've I've, I've argued with people because I'm incredibly against capital punishment. Like I think mm -hmm. that that's pretty much yeah, same here. I think it, it, Me too. Yeah, I think it demeans us as a society. I think that it really you can't have mm -hmm. a functional society where like. Also, murder, do like, you think that you you have that much trust in the justice system to think that they never got anything wrong? No. Hey, come know. on. Also, Another great point about film noir, it's, it's almost always corrupt or badly handled or right, showing you exactly. that it doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We know this from our own lives, you know. And, and also waiting to die is torture in itself, yeah. which which is makes it cruel and unusual, just that fact alone. Yeah. But the fact that they managed to get away calling themselves pro-life and not anti-choice is astounding. And mm -hmm. I so harken back to the Bill Hicks bit where if like, you're really pro-life, you'd pick it, you'd uh, block people from funerals. You know, because it's like it's it is a universal life ethos. If you're actually pro-life and you aren't, then it wouldn't be, hey, F you the second you're born, because mm -hmm. that's what it is. And and, yeah. and it's blatant hypocrisy in the fact that. The fact that uh, the, the people that are for women's choice cannot seem to be able to reframe this issue in a very clear and cogent manner that like, a, you know, a rock and roll musician can blows my mind. But whatever, that's a different show. Yeah, no, people, uh, I mean, you know, liberals, I think, for a long time have kind of ceded framing to their, to conservatives. And that's kind of been their problem on pretty much everything, right? Like, mm -hmm. there's the, the whole idea of, like, kind of a social safety net. Well, they let kind of Bush uh, start titling it entitlements. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they've yeah. they've ceded framing on every single uh, issue that they've ever fought on. So I don't... I, I know you, you and I... Not only do I know that you and I disagree in this for us, we did so on air, but, like, I'm sorry, defund the police is a terrible frame. You call it police reform if you actually want to get it done. If you want to shout something that sounds cool and make your show feel better, then defund the police, sure. Well, what, what's the end goal of that? Guess what? They're giving more funding to the police because they've effectively turned into a wedge issue for the Democrats. Yeah. So, and, again... And Biden's the one doing it, so, you know... But but it's like you could have catharsis or you can get results. And that, that's the problem is is all we are left with is catharsis. Yeah, we don't have because a nobody has any power is the other problem. Is that like we don't have somebody who's like, more like an know. after party uh, conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, this is after I don't, don't want to bring us about down talking about our or... murder movie, you know, but like, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point, though. Double, there's something cheery. There's something not depressing about double indemnity, I think. I think most noir is not depressing. Do you agree? I don't find I don't find like I dread watching it because it's really going to be a bring down. I find there's something bracing about it, but I wonder if that's just me. it's like allegory. I mean, it's it's yeah. like it's like stories, right? Like it's not like a, you know, ideally, it's not a documentary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. which it seems like. <laughs> Yeah. Which there's a whole thing with these murder, murder, murder shows mm -hmm. where somehow that's mainstream now mm -hmm. when it's like, oh, well, why is that mainstream and not like, you know, these these movies that like are telling like a very mm -hmm. compelling story and, ha mm -hmm. and have like a narrative arc to it. Mm -hmm. Like this is just like, you know, you've seen one, you've seen all of them. It's the same same business. Sorry, not a fan, but. Well, and true crime, if you get into it, is that's one of the most depressing forms there is. If you stick with true crime for long enough, man, it's it has a very very that's a good example of like it really has a a, a casa paul over your mind after a while if you keep up i put in a few years a long time ago so i'm amazed at how it's flourishing my god it's everywhere um it's, it's totally mainstream now it's crazy yeah it's just every everywhere there's so many things like i yeah. keep having to review them i can't keep up but um but film noir i like because it's it's got this quality of we're looking into the abyss and it's better looking into the abyss. It's just, there's just a feeling of like, yep, this is bad, but we're going to look right at it. And that's somehow there's, there's even a kind of excitement about it. It might be a sick excitement, but there's just th this feeling of like, yeah, we're not going to pretend it's, it's all okay or can be okay or will be okay. <laughs> Instead, has, anyone, has anyone made a, has anyone made a, like a neo-noir where it's mm. like a true crime podcaster or something that, decides to try to do the perfect uh the perfect murder or something i feel like that could be an interesting like version of this where it's someone mm -hmm. who covers all these things as like a true crime reporter trying to do the perfect crime mm -hmm. i feel like that i just thought of that 
top of my head. Ah, you should hold yeah. on to that. Giving it away for that. free. Save it yeah, for the exactly. after party, at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting for someone to have podcasting as a like as a character function mm -hmm. or uh, some sort of narrative function in a movie and not have it be completely cringe. Mm -hmm. Other like, than like uh, I, Ghostbusters Afterlife. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think only they murders in the all, building. They did it in Halloween, they did it. Oh, only Halloween murders in the building did it. As it come, yeah, only Halloween. murders in the building did it. Halloween yeah. was cringe. That was yeah. that was. Yeah, cringe no, it was I, incredibly I hated cringe. It. I hated every mm -hmm. second of it. Mm -hmm. Like not the movie, but just that character and that arc of it. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think only murders in the building, largely based on the cast, yeah. manages to make it work, and because it's kind of like a, a narrative hook in a unique way. Mm -hmm. Like it's like, oh, this is a bonding element for them, and then like, okay, so there's this other thing. But like, yeah, every time somebody puts in a movie, I'm like, ugh. And it's like that's I do that. That's the thing I do. <laughs> and I'm like, ugh, no. Yeah, well, because yeah, no, they're not good at it. It's always a, a mm. film writer that like doesn't have anything to do with. I mean, they probably hate fucking podcasts. They're like, mm. oh my god, I got to yeah. get on another podcast. I'm gonna shit on yeah. this profession. <laughs> this should mm -hmm. not exist. Um, which you know, sometimes I agree with. I really, mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of cringe podcasters out there. But um, yeah. as long as I get to choose which ones don't exist, it's not a problem. Anyway. <laughs> And some um, things are hard to make cinematic. I can remember for the longest time when when laptop when everyone started being on their computer all the time. This is a long time ago. Yeah. That how bad movies were and TV shows were whenever they incorporated a lot of it. They just couldn't find a way to. It's not yeah. very interesting to look at, and so you just have people endlessly, and it would always be like you could tell that they were typing nonsense. You know, if you yeah. they, they and, just and had the no idea. The interfaces would change so yeah. fast that like you'd see someone and you'd be like. That's like the shittiest interface I've ever seen, you know, this update. Yeah. Um, so, so I wanted to. The, the That's not how you hack it. the mainframe, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Beto O'Rourke, stop trying to hack the mainframe. <laughs> um, so, uh, no, so, so there's kind of this thing at the end um, mm -hmm. when it, it's kind of. So uh, Neff and Mrs. Diedrichson, Phyllis, Phyllis. Not, a, not a great name, but. Um, <laughs> You know, they kind of they kind of have this weird back and forth, uh -huh. um, you know, where they kind of show themselves to each other. Right. Like yeah. uh, they reveal that both of them are like these these like unhappy, cruel people that like have been using each other the entire time. They have that back and forth where um, she's like, we're both rotten. And now says only you're a little more rotten. You got me to take care of your husband for you. Then you got Zarketti to take care of Lola. Maybe take care of me, too. Then you get someone else to come along and take care of Zarketti. That's the mm -hmm. way you operate, isn't it, baby? And like so that whole, you know back and forth that they have it seems like he's almost like trying to pawn off his guilt and his uh obsession and his uh cruelty on her mm -hmm. and she's kind of you know at least being honest being like listen we're both fucking terrible we are both terrible people this is not a love story that's gonna work we are both just the worst mm -hmm. we're the worst to everybody we know like <laughs> there's no Everyone reason around us hurts or dies yeah i mean yeah but like and they both yeah, showed up yeah. to kill each other so there's this kind yeah. of yeah. Exactly. Exactly. gonna yeah. pass a moral judgment yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, should, yeah. they should both uh have like whipped them out simultaneously be like yeah that's what did she say yeah she shoots him was like oh i you know i knew i, I loved and him. she and says I she loved it fire again if i couldn't fire the second shot i'm like that's when you knew yeah, that's when you knew. <laughs> yeah, and you're kind like, of yeah, I didn't kill this. him. Yeah, like how to even take that? Because that's either the only sign of Phyllis's humanity, or is it some sort <laughs> of other maneuver? Or what? he's hard, very hard. That's the toughest moment to take in what is otherwise, yeah. I think, a perfect movie. That's yeah. the only like one that you're like. Oh, well, it kind of I mean, also harkens back to this, like to uh, like <laughs> Maltese Falcon. And that moment at the end yeah. where, um, you know, Humphrey Bogart actually has to like throw her over and he's like, you're going over. And mm -hmm. he has to reveal himself to her. Yes. She's been the same kind of the whole movie. She's been yeah. whatever, but you know. Lying, like, always a different name. <laughs> yeah. So he's like, if you, so he's like, if you don't hang, you know, yeah. you'll get out in like 25 years and then I'll be waiting. This, yeah. <laughs> but that kind of reminds me of this, except for it's both the characters doing the, uh, you know, the Humphrey yeah. Bogart. And don't you find that the Mary Astor Humphrey Bogart one, it's easier to believe that they really have, there's a more of a love story there, I think. Anyway. Yeah. To me. Well, with, with this, it seems life. like, it seems like uh, Neff is almost like hyper competitive, like yeah. uh, throughout this whole movie. <laughs> like he has to be smarter than Keys. So yeah. It makes sense because Keys has been shitting on him the entire movie. Like, you know, calling him all these like demeaning names for salesmen and stuff. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like, but then also at the end with her, it seems like he has to be, you know, I'm a little bit better than her. 
I have to be a little bit like I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm yeah. like he's convincing himself mentally that like you know that uh, the entire time you know he's been a patsy, he's been set up, she was using him, and it's like he was on board. Way like she didn't even ask him to murder anyone. He's just like, you want me to murder someone, don't you? Well, I'm in. <laughs> well, like, <laughs> we're gonna do it, baby. But of course, what he would say is she manipulated him into it. I love the, there's a wonderful close up of his face, which has never looked softer or slacker. When she, they meet for the final time in Jerry's Market, which is a fabulous location, and this really was in L.A. She has her funny sunglasses on too. Yeah, she's got these crazy sunglasses on, and and, and she's and basically they doing wartime rationing, and so they they actually posted security guards to make sure that the not just the the actors, oh, they didn't but like steal. the rest of the staff didn't steal. Oh wow, damn, <laughs> <laughs> hardcore. And now you know. Anyway, continue. wow, I did not know that. That's some good trivia. Um, but anyway, she, he's trying to st stop it. He knows Keys is onto them. It's only a matter of time, and she. She's like, nobody's no, no. And she starts using without ever having heard it, the kind of keys, what take his, his motif of there's a, you're on it. Once you committed a murder together, you're on a trolley car and you have trolley car. You have to write it all the way to the end of the line. Um, and then the last stop at the cemetery, she says, it's, it's right down the line. We're not, nobody's pulling out. And he, and he's like, and she takes off the sunglasses very slowly to show, to show him her like rattlesnake eyes. Like, look, look, yeah. look at me, look at who I am. And his face is just like, it's, it goes right up on the edge of comic. He's so shocked. <laughs> he just, and there's this huge like choker close up of his face, like registering like who he's been playing with the whole time, which is, that's so noir. So mm -hmm. then she's like, like, now he finally gets what Chris was obvious all along. She's this incredible, she, he thinks he's smart. She's been running the show from the whole time. That, that's very much the noir thing. So he, he, I think in the end, he's taking on the tone that you're going to get in most film noir, which is always, oh, you're, the woman was better than me at being a complete, you know, a complete liar, manipulator, killer, whatever. And that's an outrage. <laughs> so Yeah, but then he, and then he, AKA and then he's like, cool. She was cooler that, being cool. She yeah. was cooler. She was cooler. <laughs> she was better. She did it better. Yeah, yeah. But then yeah. he, he tries to pawn off his guilt onto her. Yes. Like as well. She's so really bad. Like, you see the end like, of yeah. Out of the Past. It's the same. They have the same kind of discussion in Out of the Past. That's the Robert Mitchum, Jane Greer, also a great noir. Yeah, we, we. I think we brought that up the other night, right? Yeah. Uh, we did, we did, yeah. Very. Yeah. Similar. I, I think it made the first round of of our, our brutal brackets yeah. to big movies for this. That's month. a good one because you know she says they have the same open conversation she even says i'm glad you know everything because now we can finally talk like right <laughs> <laughs> and like why we really go together and of course yeah. he's all the time plotting to make to make sure she doesn't get away with it um but she's kind of right you listen to it and you're like you know she's kind of right and it's a version of yeah i'm rotten you're rotten maybe i'm a little more rotten but we're both rotten you know let's get together on this and there's always <laughs> the sense of the man is like i draw the line there missy um yeah so there's that that's happening again here for sure yeah 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 and it's well, also she sets the scene so there is like she knows he's coming she knows he's coming with a gun she, she, she has puts a gun. her gun on yeah, the seat cushion to be ready cushion. i mean she's just so far ahead she's always so far ahead of him yeah, turning off all um, the lights. The other, yeah, all the lights off exactly. So the other, the other thing I wanted to talk about um, is, you know, I mean, the dialogue in this is so good. Yeah, but yeah. there's the uh, like I, I love the first scene. Obviously, I mean, it's the one that everybody talks about. But mm -hmm. when he's saying, um, "There's a speed limit in this state, yeah. Mr. F, 45 miles an hour," and he goes, "How fast was I going, officer?" So I'd say mm -hmm. about 90. He's like, I, uh, "Suppose you get off your motorcycle, give me a ticket," and she's like, "Suppose I let you off with a warning." She's mm -hmm. like, "Suppose it doesn't take." And, <laughs> Yeah, and then he's like, uh, on and on, ping pong. But then, but then the most yeah. awkward, because I, yeah. I remember, so I took uh, intro to acting, and this mm -hmm. is before I ever saw uh, Double Indemnity. Mm -hmm. um, one of the scenes they had us do for this intro to acting class was that back and forth, and like mm -hmm. you had a partner, and you had to do Whoa. that with that partner. How well did that go? I mean, I don't, I don't, I probably blanked it out of my mind. I, I did not like. <laughs> he's, he's hosting time. this show. How well do you think it went? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just wondering if people were really uncomfortable. I would be very uncomfortable. It's I think very people, stylized. People, People did it uh, in different ways. Like, you know uh, what I mean? Like, I think they would do different tones to it, which is kind of fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Kind of show off for your classmates as, mm -hmm. you know, the first year. The, the TV show Barry mm -hmm. does a really good job of showing those types of interactions and mm -hmm. what they actually are like. Mm -hmm. It does a lot of things really well. But, like, mm -hmm. that's one thing that blew my mind. Of like, wow, that actually mm -hmm. kind of is when people, like, are, like, learning how to act, but kind of not quite there yes. yet. Yeah, I guess I, I saw the first couple Great episodes. I, had, I didn't end up watching past there because at the time I didn't have HBO, but now I do, and so I should watch it. You <laughs> gotta catch up on that one. It's very, yeah, it's quite so, good. 
But mm -hmm. as introduced yeah, he, one of the greater character actors of the last few years too. But mm -hmm. that's a separate after party. Remind me or don't. <laughs> Either way. Um, no, but so, what I like so, about that dialogue yeah. is it's very screwball comedy, which was which was popular. You know, there was a big overlap between the two. Screwball comedy also features the woman often who's taking charge and you know running the tables on the guy. But it's all in a comedic mode, and but it, and she's usually showing him how to live. He's more traditional, like you see, bringing up baby, and she's wilder and crazier and more more of a, a true modern um but it has it looks very much like that ping-ponging kind of dialogue that they have it's super rapid and wilder just lets it be pretty much a, f a funny exchange that's what it is um which is kind of nice that's a nice thing about film noir that often isn't credited how often it's funny not everyone yeah but like but this so hilarious so my, lines through out of the past really funny so my uh my my thing that i was gonna say with this is mm -hmm. it's like you know it is screwball comedy it's that back and forth right like mm -hmm. like where she's kind of playing coy and he's like you know and he's mm -hmm. doing the thing and then it gets very awkward when he's like how about i bust out crying and put my head <laughs> on your shoulders is the, is the line that gets insanely <laughs> awkward it's like all right like he's Push too far into that back and forth. One right. joke over the line. Yeah, and then <laughs> yeah. she's like, you know, and then but she has, she's like, uh, you know, suppose you put it on my husband's shoulder, and then uh -huh. he gets fucking pissed. He goes, "All right, that'll take or something." It walks, yeah. <laughs> walks out. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. I just, I always found it kind of like a, it's an incredibly <laughs> dynamic um, exchange mm -hmm. in that moment, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it shows you a lot about these characters, right? Like she's at first flirting back with him, and then mm -hmm. draws that like hard line to see, you know, kind of kind of push him back, and then he's mm -hmm. his response to it just like kind of storm off and I, I don't know i just always kind of i think you that shows you a lot about those two characters in that right moment. and there's also the extra layer of her no her set she's staging all of these scenes and playing a part the whole time you know so, yeah. so that helps you because she's stanwick is very very good at doing just a slightly overly exaggerated just a nice woman concerned for her husband you can sort of see where she moves into certain types of acting but at a certain point, you're thinking, no, she she was acting the whole time when he shows up and he's like, hubba hubba. So the maids, the maids day off. <laughs> you know, she sets all yeah. that up. She she's she's enabling all of that crazy shit to go on. So that's yeah. that's part of the greatness of the performance is her knowing everything. And and from the very beginning, you know, you see her in the it's such a it's kind of a stupid line. But when you first see her um, <laughs> and he says, oh, is everything covered? And she's like, oh, I'm sure I know what you mean or something. Yeah. It's like. Yeah, because you're in a you're you're in a towel. You're in a towel, and we yeah, don't know yeah. if there's anything. On the implication is she might have been nude sunbathing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And if you notice, she's standing in front of the railing that has like curly cues, where like shall we say the female? Yeah. <laughs> and a chart would be the female. Per yeah, I noticed. System. So yeah, they're very you know Wilder was very good at you know getting past censors things that you know they just wouldn't notice. So that was a big game for him. And at some point, he just, you know, dresses Jack Lemon up uh, in drag. And, know, well, just, let's see, let's, let's see if we can get the wave with this one. <laughs> let's put Marilyn Monroe in a dress that's essentially sheer. <laughs> and we'll just keep teasing where the spotlight is and how much we're going to show. You know, he got away with murder. He really did. Often. You know, very, very good movie. I think I like The Apartment better, though. Ultimately. That one's wonderful. I, too. I was well, going to say, you know, you know who didn't class. get away with murder? Walter, <laughs> Walter no. <Neff. laughs> By the way, how great is that line that I couldn't hear my own footsteps? It was the Walter oh, I love that. Line. That's one of my favorite lines. I loved it. it was the Walter that is that is that is like classic noir line, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, you could just perfect. see Frank Miller in the movie theater, just like writing right. that. Down. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly. exactly. Right. Yes, and I always have wanted to write something about that. About that kind of again, the the evocation of the occult, the ghostly. The, there's a there's a whole thing that runs through noir that's so great. One of the reasons I love the Coen Brothers, the man who wasn't there, is is they they bring it to the fore. If you've ever seen that movie, it did terribly, mm -hmm. bombed. But um, there's a whole space alien <laughs> angle that he brings in. There's yeah, that was surprising. Yeah, otherworldly stuff that they bring in, which in fact is a, he goes to visit a psychic, a phony psychic. There's all and they said, well, well you got to have a phony psychic. All those novels we loved always had a phony psychic. It's one of the pulp noir you know, characters that are typical. So it really is. It's threaded through the whole form in a way that, that when they do neo-noir, they almost never pick up on it. almost never shows up in, in, in newer attempts to do noir. But anyway, yeah. that killed the conversation. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, Cody, you want to do uh, letterbox one-liners? I was going to let Andy oh. take a swing because, because he's, he, he's been kind of, 
edged no, out. I, I was it. actually looking up something that I was going to reference. Uh, Billy in, Wilder. Um, Sorry. Um, <laughs> Oh, yeah, um, but but uh, I, I haven't found it yet. So uh, wait, is okay. that it? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, that's the name of it. Um, uh, yeah, no, no, it was. Uh, I, I was just going to uh, mention that that uh, uh, one of my favorite comic book creators, uh, Ed Brubaker. Mm -hmm. You know, you could see oh, a yeah. lot of um, this, and uh, definitely criminal, but uh, I, I think more so in Fatal. Uh, I don't know if uh, Conan, mm -hmm. you've read that one. I haven't read that one, but I like Brubaker's okay. stuff. It's good. Yeah, Br Brubaker's great. If, if you like more, Pretty consistent. check out Ed Brubaker. Uh, he does a lot of work with Sean Phillips. And mm -hmm. Sean Phillips always draws these beautiful Dutch angles. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of heavy shadows. His, his artwork's gorgeous. And I've been a fan, you know, I mean, since he was doing Hellblazer back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, I was, mm -hmm. I was young. <laughs> Letterbox is a social media site for film, a place where film lovers get to talk at, with, and to each other mm -hmm. about the movies they love, the movies they didn't love, the movies they were baffled by, the movies they were weirdly thirsty for. And all of these reviews are best expressed uh, in the, the one-liner format. No Eberts, no Siskels. Everybody gets to have their say. Open source democracy, bottom up, let's go. This is the bit, the Letterbox one-liners for double indemnity forest cautionary tale for simps everywhere <laughs> <laughs> big, big simpin in this uh in this big, big simpin. simpin ain't easy yeah <laughs> billy wilder's dialogue makes aaron sorkin and david mamet look like kindergartners <laughs> i would agree with that because like like mm -hmm. I, I it was just i was thinking about that the entire time of how much like um, you know, this is what people who, who, uh, have not seen Billy Wilder praise Sorkin for. And I'm yeah. just like, you know, I, I'm pretty sure like, you know, you talk to them, they probably never seen a Billy Wilder film. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Every film noir, this film fatale has seduced and murdered 17 <laughs> people, me. And I hope she seduces and murders me next. <laughs> <laughs> Your guys are also good at this. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you let someone talk with you about your car's extended warranty <laughs> well, actually that's really funny because I, had a, I got a call today after doing these and about the car. <laughs> i don't even have i don't even own a car so i don't know right, right. <laughs> that's right. Man, you're lucky because i only got life alert calling me today mm. the best insurance movie in the world Oh. Yeah. I, I can't disagree with that. I, I would say I, one of the great insurance movies of all time. Really, maybe maybe the best. It's up there. It's up there. I, I would say the the only uh, other noir that that uh, covers insurance would have to be um, uh, the two Jakes because uh, there's this one character named Liberty, and at one point they go Liberty, Liberty, and I just thought <laughs> my brain just filled in mutual. So <laughs> so yes, movie night extravaganza brought to you by Liberty Mutual. No. <laughs> Apparently, I would have just kept to the life of drinking beers at a drive-in <laughs> during the day. <laughs> Dude had the life. He's a little, he's a little fiendy about it. Like, you know, he's like, "Oh, I'll have some rum or something." And then he's I'm gonna do, go to the drive-in. Yeah, he's he's drive -in. Well, that he's was the car, life, man. Like, he's have a single beer. bottle of beer on his window and like just lamping, just lamping. You know. Wow. He also he also I says I had to I had to wash out the taste of her uh you know Sour her iced, iced tea. tea. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> This would never happen to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, that's a simp in waiting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cautionary tale about women who wear anklets. Well, true though. <laughs> you know, you don't you don't trust the women that wear anklets. If I got involved with a dame named Phyllis, I too would address her exclusively <laughs> as baby. <laughs> So Nobody likes like... that name. But clearly, that's a name that is at been ash canned by everyone. Wow. That's a well. It just reminds me of like a, a like a mother or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like no, it's like Maude like, oh, and, and all those. Other Phyllis, things. get in here. <laughs> I think of Phyllis Schlafly, which is not what I think of when oh. I think of owners. Oh yeah, that's not good. Yeah. It's uh, it's a big Phyllis Schlafly week though. Technically, I guess. Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're not in Medford. We're in a hurry. I want to be Edward G. Robinson when I grow up. 
Oh, Underrated man. exchange, by the way. Like, like <laughs> when he's talking to Medford, bro. Like, and, and, and well, in Medford, you know, it's great. That's awesome. Anyway, those are the letterbox one liners for double indemnity. Please. <laughs> Follow the show, Move Next Travaganza, on Letterbox. That's Forrest Miller over there, your host. I, of course, am Kona Neutron. I'm all over Letterbox. You can find me on there as well. J. Andrew World is uh, on Letterbox as well. Please follow him as well as all of our future guests and uh, co-hosts, et cetera, et cetera. Eileen, we'll talk to you on there eventually at some point. Okay. I'll, but, be, uh, I'll yeah, suck I, at it. I, 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 I'm filled I with it, admiration. It's really look, great. You're saying this bit is like the cream of the crop. Mm, Let me assure right. you, it is not oh. all that good. Oh, all right. That's <laughs> hey, you should my she writes like real. She writes real film reviews, though. I feel uh, like Letterbox yeah. is for all of us that like wish we were writing like act like you know professional film reviews to get you paid for it. We're like, you know what? We're just gonna <laughs> type it out on this phone and, and make everybody. <laughs> yeah, but the snappy one-liner is such a skill. You know, that's like well, an it, admirable it skill. Oh, and that's yeah. one of the things I like the most about that bit is you kind of get like the best mm -hmm. of the best of that. Mm -hmm. Although it, it is in fact, as we've pointed out multiple times mm -hmm. over, I would not really appear in this bit too mm -hmm. often. Cause I tend to go long form, mm -hmm. but yeah. You know, I, Billy when Wilder I saw drive my car, Billy Wilder would, on, would kill it on letterbox. Billy oh, Wilder he would. Slay. He would. Yeah. He would. He would. Yeah. I mean, I think my review of drive my car was, Truth in advertising. She did indeed drive his car, which I thought was pretty good. <laughs> that is good. By the way, did you ever get to the end of that movie? I I'm still watching it. Okay. <laughs> Jay Andrew World, here. take it away with the. I was going to say, all right, if you are watching us right now on Twitch, um, please subscribe if you can. If you happen to have an Amazon uh, Prime membership, you can subscribe for free, and that helps us out greatly. Um, uh, if you're watching us over on YouTube, do the YouTube things, hit the like button, um, subscribe. Uh, put a comment, ring that bell. And, you know, one real th uh, crazy thing that actually does help us out a lot, watch the video to the end to help other film fans, uh, you know, find our work. Um, the also, hardest ask of all. Yeah, that is a hard <laughs> But you got a great Conan Neutron song at the end, you know, you killing do. it on yeah. that. You could also, though, you could press the yellow thing on, on your browser or whatever and put it down there and just leave it going. You know what I mean? You don't have mm -hmm. to. Engage. Yeah. I mean, you should, but I'm continue, just saying, like, continue doom scrolling. You know, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, we also have a Patreon. Uh, we plan on expanding Patreon, especially since I'm moving, and we'll have a uh, space to podcast more often. So that'll be a uh, uh, a lot more. Um, I can actually create some bonus content for y'all. Um, I feel uh, like we podcast plenty personally, but I don't no, know. No, I, I think you're right. But <laughs> the thing is, though, is right now I'm taking up the living room and my poor family, who you can occasionally see in the background. Yeah, we get it. We get it. Not yeah. speak uh, for like uh, the time that we're on. Mm -hmm. So um, you, don't, you don't want to do my podcast idea, which is, you know, best anklets of, uh, <laughs> of, of, of cinema a, history. In the new house. In the new house. It, it's it's his third, it's third most popular after the Jonathan Banks podcast we mentioned earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Billy Wilder had an anklet thing. It also comes in. To his movie love in the afternoon so this so that's like his feet <laughs> um i had i had an idea for a podcast earlier i was listening to uh revolution to the podcast that goes through like revolutionary history and they're mm -hmm. talking about the bourbon monarchy and i was like all right bourbon monarchy that's my podcast where <laughs> i'm going to drink whiskey and like report on uh, live breaking news about the royal family in britain bourbon <laughs> monarchy that's my <laughs> yeah you know, well that is that niche probably, man. That, that, would that would probably, probably work do well yeah, yeah. Like people love stupid shit, man. Yeah. People love stupider the better, man. <laughs> love it. Better yet, just go through the history of a while you're drunk. <laughs> like drunk history, but it's the royal family version. It's the used, royal you know. family. Yeah. 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 I, I that is a thing. That, look, there's a lot of things in life. I'm like, I'm glad people get something out of it. I don't get anything out of it. That's one thing. I'm like, that's the thing. That's the thing you're into, huh? The you know, uh, we had a war to like not have to give a shit about that. You exactly. That? This is what I say. I have. I literally have relatives. I won't name how close that that they subscribe to Royal Magazine and they uh. follow it all. And I'm just like, it's exactly what I say. Like, is that like can't cat fancy for royalist? <laughs> yes. It's the most. Well, insane. the thing the thing I think that's that's kind of funny though about you know okay. our version of that, right? Like this side of the old pond, as they say, um, <laughs> like. Uh, we don't have to pay for it. You know what I mean? Like, like mm. literally British people are paying taxes to yeah. kind of subsidize yeah. like the, the world's most expensive welfare family, you know, yeah. you know <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, just so they can go big simping on the, the Royals. Oh, exactly. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but, but the, so thing. we can, I mean, I don't, I have no interest in it personally. Mm. I, I would like to see that family toppled, but you mm. know, 
I could see that you're sitting here. You're like, well, I'm not paying for this. It's kind of like free entertainment that, mm-hmm. you know, British people are paying for. <laughs> right. right. I <laughs> kind of hacked their Netflix account. Oh, it's like the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like how we get Doctor Who. They pay the taxes. We get yeah. Doctor yeah. Who. Yeah. Exactly. That works out. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's the oh. decent war matt yeah. gilbert you clearly did not see the last time eileen was on <laughs> Yikes. yeah no i've read a lot of very respectful comments in the in the after month so i just guess people liked it you know oh well what can it i do it was fine a lot of people the like the northman you know people like shit what can i do so, I was gonna so watch it before. Everyone, awesome. I was gonna watch it before the Oscars because I was on a, a uh-huh. podcast talking about movies in there, and yeah. I watched a bunch of them, like the bunch of the movies that were nominated, because I didn't really watch any of them until mm. that. And then it was like two and a half hours, and I was like, I can't. I'm not. I'm not gonna put that time in just yeah. to do like a podcast episode for an hour of people like. Yeah. I don't know. I watched. Uh, I watched. It's, it's still Pizza, Toro, which I like. so it's good. <laughs> it's it's just you know not as good as like the original. Um, Sure. I just assume there's a fishman involved in <laughs> every movie he does as a fishman. Just you know, most of them. <laughs> That's right. Some of them have vampires, and some of them have guys with eyeballs in their floor. Uh, in their floor. Uh, Pan's Labyrinth is so good. Yeah, but, Pan's um, Labyrinth is much better, I think. Yeah, yes. but it's, it's like, always it's always very handsome. You know, it's very handsomely shot and handsomely yeah. designed and all that jazz. So if you like that sort of thing, yeah, there's something for you yeah, for no, two and a half hours. Toro. Del Toro always has quality to his films. Mm. So, you know, it's just how good it actually is, is another story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was, I was, it's going to sound mood at this point, but I, but I was like, yeah, the, 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 the fish people is going to be like the Dick Miller to Joe Dante of Gilmer, Gilmer Toller. Ugh, I can't say the guy's name. Doing a great job, everybody. Hey, Dick Miller. That's the, that's the joke. That's the joke. <laughs> But I always like like seeing like you know uh, you know Killbots. Hey, there's Dick Miller. Okay, so it's Joe Dante's associated now. Huh? All right, you know it's like Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell. It's like they're always it's like intertwined. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the fish Sam Raimi, topical, uh, topical. So yeah, you topical. brought it all back. You brought it all brought back it all around. Back. We're back. Christina, I'm sure we'll have lots to say about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. She, I don't, I don't. She, she was joking earlier, and she's like, "Oh, I'm tired. Never mind," or something, and then hasn't responded to my message i i assume she's coming on but um i, I can tell yeah. you what she's done is posted a lot of memes about that film anyway <laughs> um which i'm like yeah. yo this came out this morning come on back it off but yeah I mean, I um final thoughts, <laughs> final on, thoughts. On, on this are you going to join us for the after party thing for a little i don't bit, think or? i can i'm wiped q guys you got All more right. energy you're oh, young and fine. energetic and i'm fading fast <laughs> sorry Final it's thoughts. Forest. Forest is young and I'm energetic. Oh, yeah. is that how it works out? Well, <laughs> you, know, you gotta share <laughs> the go. load. <laughs> and he's too busy ill- illustrating cat fancy for royalists. <laughs> I will say that one of the, the pleasures of watching film noir is everybody smokes and drinks all the time. So with a great deal of style. So there's there's a style element we never got to, but it really um, can pay off in shooting style, in the way actors look. There's a lot of clothing styling going on, but it's the smoking and drinking with great panache that that can really be um, a, a, a delight that you just can't get now because you know people. There's a lot of guy. Face. There's a lot of guy like another guy's uh, in this movie specifically. I mean, constantly. Guy, you know, like, <laughs> there's a lot of guy eating guy with cigarettes go action yeah. going on here. Because he, yeah, he yeah, can't. Yeah. He just can't carry like uh, matches yeah. with him. He just he's too tense and they mm-hmm. explode in his pocket. That's such a weird line. I don't like. I've never heard anyone say anything like that. You know what I mean? Like be like, well, they always explode in my pocket. It's like, no. dude, the, what are you like? What are you wearing? <laughs> what are you? What are you <laughs> I think you're doing mad. Matches for innuendo. <laughs> they must be like ru- oh, maybe like yeah. they're rubbing together or something, and then they light yeah, something yeah, in his pocket. Yeah, like, ah, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're rubbing together. Let me tell they're you, rubbing together. All right. Yes. Mm. Somehow managed to make it dirty. Great. Yeah, <laughs> you really did. Thank you for mm-hmm. that. Yeah, I did my best. <laughs> And I wish I had more thoughts, but I'm out of thoughts. I, that was my last thought. Sorry. <laughs> well, that was a good one. Thanks for sharing it with us. Mm. Uh, yeah, Conan got some. Oh uh, uh, yeah. Some, some... A final, a final. A, g- a great, great noir movie. I love that it's kicking mm. it off, and that we're doing everything uh, sequentially as we kind of go through the various tropes, just like we do with mm. Murder Night Extravaganza. Mm. You know, starting off with Psycho and and whatnot, or. Mm. Uh, 
Uh, I like that this is kind of like Dunning Kruger effect for well, if I did it, dot dot dot, sort of insurance fraud. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's kind of an underrated part of it that people rightly kind of maybe blast past because of all the other aspects of it, basically mm -hmm. being like people being terrible and like other noirish mm -hmm. tropes, but done very as as Eileen said, very stylishly, mm -hmm. right? Like and and uh, I think that there's a lot to love here even if you're not a fan of the genre of noir because i think it's a very well done mm -hmm. movie mm -hmm, uh, scores great mm -hmm. the composition cinematography is fantastic uh, so many quotable lines like mm -hmm. it's and it moves right along you know and when it does like the rat-a-tat it's moving done right along probably better music in the muppet movie but uh, you know, it, 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 it's a watch <laughs> <laughs> but but I think this is probably an easier entry into the genre than say the Maltese Falcon or something, which takes mm, oh, I agree. more seriously. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it, you know, you could do a lot worse. Like if I, I didn't see Double Indemnity until I was always already pretty familiar uh, with the genre, and I was mm -hmm. like, oh, this is like I should have started with this one. This is mm -hmm. kind of got a little bit of everything. I love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So great movie, great. Uh, I was not stoked. I was not bummed out at all that we were starting with this. I was pretty stoked about it, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, looking forward to kind of dissecting, dissecting. God, that's yeah. We're gonna vivisect the genre. No, we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> uh, discuss all of it as it kind of advances uh, through the years. And I think it's gonna mm -hmm. be real cool to like reference back to this as as an earlier one because there's mm -hmm. a lot of stuff here that you see later on, and or you see people moving away from or mm -hmm. referencing. Uh, and uh, yeah, good film ultimately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a mm -hmm. great film. Yeah. Um, Andy. I got to say, like, this is one of those movies that I'm not quite sure if I've seen before or not, mm -hmm. uh, because it's like so ingrained in our in our memory. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I mentioned this many times before, but I know Eileen hasn't heard it. So I'm going to mm -hmm. say this. Um, I grew up in Georgia and we get uh, Channel 17 Superstation from uh, Turner, um, mm -hmm. like for free on our, our broadcast television. Mm -hmm. So so I uh, there was a lot of old movies constantly on as a little kid. Mm -hmm. And I've watched a lot of stuff that I don't even know what it was. Right, right. Um, uh, so, so whether or not I've seen this movie or it's just like so ingrained into the culture, mm -hmm. I don't know, but this is the first time I've seen it as an adult. So mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll leave it at there. And this was a great watch because it really is everything you want in a noir film. Um, mm -hmm. And it's way better than the sequels, you know, too fast, too indemnity. And um, <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Double, uh, triple and demo three. <laughs> three yeah. for the evening. Yeah. Yes. And, and he's been sitting on that for two days. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah. worth it. Well worth it. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, so no, it's, yeah, I, I, I thoroughly did enjoy this because it is just, um, is beautiful. And I love those shadows. Like anytime. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I also like uh, the version I watched was a nice cleaned up for like a remastered mm. one. Mm. Um, yeah. and then like the trailer for us showed, uh, I, th I think it was the trailer or something I was watching was like an older, muddier, uh, you know, print of the film. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it's nice to actually see the, the yeah. crisper, uh, you know, cleaned up version, uh, Thanks because it really, it really is a beautiful film. Mm -hmm. You can really see the anklet in the cleaned up version. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and I, I had day. a version of your experience. I, I had the New York version of watching movies the same way, chopped up all to hell, running on TV. You didn't know what you were watching. I think that's a great education. Well, that's the same education the Coen brothers got. And they said that's how why they have no snob factor and yep. why they, they would they loved equally like bad Tony Curtis movies and art movies yeah. and Looney was, Tune cartoons and everything just ran in a slurry with a million commercials. And it, it was a kind of surreal education of its own. Really is that and Elvira and Kung yeah. Fu Theater like all mixed together. So mm -hmm. you yeah. know, I, I got a weird uh, film education as a small child. Yeah, I think it's I'm I approve of it. <laughs> it's a good one. All right. Well, my final thoughts are mm. what did you think I was? Anyway, some guy that walks into a good looking Dave's apartment and says, I sell excellent <laughs> clearance on husbands. You got one that's been around too long? <laughs> <laughs>